Say you want to buy something, a, a loaf of bread perhaps. You go to the store, find the brand you want, pay the price that's marked on the label, and you're on your way. And odds are, the next time you go to buy bread, it'll be the same brand at the same price. But if you buy a house, well, that's a completely different experience. You're going to have to deal with inspections, title searches, mortgage lenders, closing costs, brokers, etc., etc. But the most unusual thing, for American consumers anyway, is that there's never a fixed price for any house. None. And the prices of houses have been going up. From the early 50s through the early 70s, inflation-adjusted housing prices actually declined a bit, but ever since then, they've been taking off, rising about 70% since that time. And now, they're even topping housing bubble highs from 2006. There are a lot of reasons for this, which is why single-track attempts to put a lid on housing prices generally fail. They don't look at the whole problem. We're going to take a look at the high cost of housing and what we can do about it on this episode of Progressive Solutions. Before we get to our list, I'd like to invite you to join Progressive Solutions subscriber list. And as always, I welcome your comments. Let me know what you're thinking and what other topics you'd like to see here. One more thing, we're only looking directly at suburban single-family housing. That's because the cost of multi-unit housing generally rises and falls along with the prices of single-family houses. The cost of even renting a duplex, a townhouse, or an apartment depends in large part on the cost of buying that family home. We're going to look at each topic on the list separately and then combine them to see what measures are needed to combat the entire pantheon. First up... This is a simple supply and demand issue. Every year, the population of the United States rises by two or three million people. Those extra millions of people need to live somewhere, so demand goes up. But the supply is constant. We're basically done acquiring new territory. Since the demand is going up, but supply remains the same, the price goes up too. But there's a related problem, which is... After World War II, suburban growth took off. Land, even close by major cities, was quite cheap at the time, so companies such as Levitt and Sons, the founders and builders of the famous Levitt towns, well, they could scoop up a lot of land and build away. Interestingly, the main Levitt town on New York's Long Island had fairly small houses, but lot sizes that were quite large for the time of about 6,000 square feet. Today, most suburbs consider that size to be minimum, and lot sizes of 7,200 to 10,000 square feet or larger, those are minimums in a lot of places. Larger lot sizes mean longer pipes for water and sewage, more roads and road maintenance, hello, taxes, and fewer homes, which means higher prices. But as lot sizes have increased, so is something else. From the early 1920s through to the late 40s, house sizes were pretty stable, although there was an interesting spike for a couple of years right in the middle of World War II. Starting in 1950, however, house sizes grew spectacularly. Today's average new house is more than three times as big as the average new house built in 1949, and even 50% bigger than a house built in 1985. Many people consider this alone to be the driving cost factor, as home costs haven't risen as fast as new home sizes. But home costs, that is, the price you pay to buy a home, well, those include older homes as well. The price for new homes is rising a lot faster than even new home sizes. Nevertheless, the typical 800-square-foot house of the late 1940s is pretty scarce now. Most of today's houses on the market are two to three times as big, so they should cost a lot more although not that much more. Cheaper materials and building methods are all over the place now. The cost per square foot to build a new house, inflation adjusted, is a lot lower than it used to be. One big reason that both lot sizes and house sizes have increased so much is... Prior to the 1950s, a lot of people didn't own cars, and most families that did had just one. This meant that shopping and other activities, well, they mostly had to be within walking distance. When we entered World War II, one-fourth of all families didn't even own a car. By 1955, one-fourth of all families had two cars. This meant that suburban developments with nothing but single-family houses were available to most Americans. Since people didn't need to live so close to work, shopping, school, and other activities, 
separate single-family homes, well, they became more desirable and accessible, and larger lots and houses could happen. And these changes led to another set of changes. Just about anyone who's gotten involved in their local political scene has dealt with zoning. Zoning laws can basically tell people what they can use their property for, such as housing or light manufacturing or, or commercial stores or whatever, and also how much they can build on their land, how much off-street parking they have to have, a, a whole lot more. Zoning laws have a long and checkered history. Nobody's really certain when the first zoning laws were passed, but what we do know is they were generally pushed by factory owners and other wealthy people who wanted to get away from the lower classes. One major reason that lot sizes have increased is that zoning laws often have a minimum lot size requirement. Zoning can also limit a homeowner's ability to build a second house, often called an accessory dwelling unit, or colloquially a mother-in-law. More on that later. Zoning laws in the future will also have to contend with the new reality of... Back in the day, as the saying goes, a lot of people worked for just one company their entire career. But today, most workers tend to switch jobs every few years, and a lot of those job switches also involve moving to a new city. Fifty years ago, the standard advice for a home buyer was not to buy a house unless you were going to be there for at least 10 years, because that's about how long it took to recoup the costs of buying, such as interest payments, closing costs, broker's fees, etc. Today, however, a lot of people sell their houses just a few years after they buy them as they move to a new city, and then they buy a new house in that new city. That's one of the reasons why existing home sales have quadrupled from 1970 to 2006. All those extra home sales mean that prices are going to rise because people need to recoup their costs even faster. Of course, a lot of this moving around and being able to afford the higher prices is mostly limited to the well-off and upper classes, which brings us to... It's not just the 1% who are raking in enormous amounts of money. The next 19% behind them, they're doing quite well too. They're the ones who can buy immediately, even if they haven't sold their own house yet, and they can afford to pay a lot more because they're making a lot more. This is the factor behind rising housing costs that few, if any, are talking about. Possibly because politicians and pundits cater to the top 20%. They are the major political donors and the key advertising demographic, and politicians and pundits don't want to upset them. From the mid-50s to the mid-70s, even as housing sizes increased steadily, inflation-adjusted prices didn't. In fact, even as late as 1986, the inflation-adjusted median price for a home sale was no higher than it had been in 1957. But then things changed. Prices jumped, plateaued, and then skyrocketed. Yes, house and lot sizes got bigger, and zoning laws tried to limit overdevelopment, and more people moved more often and bought more homes, but... The wealth gap that started to show up in the mid-80s, that was a major driving force. The people who were buying most of the houses could afford to pay a lot more, and pay a lot more they did, driving prices up mercilessly. From 1980 through to the mid-90s, home ownership dropped, in large part because the combination of the wealth gap and rising housing prices made home ownership unaffordable for many Americans. And that brings us to the last category. In 1995, President Clinton and his HUD secretary, Henry Cisneros, announced a new initiative to push home ownership to record highs, an initiative highly supported by Republicans as well. Some of the elements of this plan included reducing down payment requirements, speeding up mortgage approvals, and counseling first-time buyers on how to navigate the process of buying a house. The idea was to help people become homeowners who were being shut out of the ever-increasingly expensive process. Of course, Home prices had plateaued starting in the early 90s, but then, after the Clinton Initiative took hold, they began to skyrocket worse than ever. That's right. The housing bubble didn't start with the 1999 repeal of Glass-Steagall. It started a few years earlier with the Clinton Housing Initiative. We need to be smarter about how we work to make housing more affordable by learning from past mistakes. So why would President Clinton start this trend? Well, it's not because that was his goal. His goal was the same as every president going back at least as far as FDR, increasing home ownership. In a 1942 speech, President Roosevelt said, A nation of homeowners, of people who own a real share in their own land, is unconquerable. Now, this was during World War II, so the phrasing was intentional. Increased home ownership would help us win the war. 
But FDR had been pushing home ownership for a long time. He had even created the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA, eight years earlier. Since then, the federal government has been all about getting as many people as possible to own their own home. And the lengths to which the government has gone, well, sometimes they've created more problems than they've solved. All of these factors have combined to make housing far more expensive. So, finally, we come to the question, what can we do about it? The biggest and most difficult change will be to alter government policy, both at the federal and the local level, to encourage smaller houses, smaller lot sizes, and a lot more multi-unit housing. We need to change FHA policies, as well as the policies of its cousins, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Continuing to finance and encourage ever larger single-family housing, especially for people who can barely manage the payments, it's just bad policy. Attempts have been made to relax zoning laws, but they haven't worked out very well. Uh, for instance, in Seattle, they got rid of height limits on downtown construction, and the result was a new wave of luxury building as those new higher floors went for $15,000 a month and more. On the other hand, zoning ordinances can reduce minimum lot size and even put in a maximum lot size, as well as encouraging more subdivision of larger lots and, oh yes, construction of accessory dwelling units. All too often, what's called city planning isn't. It's just a, a patchwork of small changes to individual neighborhoods without a true vision. Good city planning should look at the whole picture, including where neighborhood business districts can exist side by side with denser housing systems. With proper city planning, such as ending new suburban sprawl construction and replacing it with more compact development, people won't need cars as much. Better planning for higher population density can also bring in more mass transit and reduce the need for cars even more. And that's not only a lot less expensive, it's a lot greener. We're not going to push the possibilities of affordable housing laws that require developers to set aside some percentage of their new housing for people who can't afford market rates or to provide tax credits for developers who do. The reason is they don't work. Either developers choose to forego the tax breaks or the number of affordable units they build isn't nearly enough and often the affordable units aren't really that affordable to most people. But fixing the wealth gap will make housing much more affordable for a lot of people, even if it doesn't bring down the cost of housing. Fixing the wealth gap is a topic for a whole new video, and probably even more than one. The reasons for rising housing costs are a patchwork of partial problems, and they're going to require a patchwork of partial solutions. The real problem, though, is that most Americans like living in larger houses in more isolated spaces, and we're going to have to change that view before we can change anything else. We can keep on pushing out into more distant, more exclusive suburban communities, or at least those who can afford to do it can do that, but we can also get a grip on reality and, and rediscover the, the convenience and the low cost of living in more compact communities. Okay, now it's your turn. How would you bring down housing costs? What do you think of the ideas I've proposed? And uh, what do you think of housing subsidies? And if you like them, who would you give them to and how would you pay for them? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Stay progressive.